Our imagination of blindness and what it does to the other senses comes from Oedipus. From Oedipus, we get the idea that blindness is a story about guilt and things you can't look at. And so you take your eyes out because of what you did. So it's, a, it's, it's our cultural imagination of denial and grief and regret. You know, when you go through something like I did of going blind young, you're a kind of monster, you're a kind of omen. That's what the root of the word monster is, is to show, it's an omen. I am one of those people who hated the police before I became a cop. I'm one of those people who is convinced they are, they are all sexist bastards, they are misogynist, they are homophobic, they are racist, they are classist, they are everything. Well, you know what? I hated to admit it, but it was not true. In the monsters that I had in my head, they're not there. They're just fallible human beings doing a job that nobody really likes all that much. People will hear me saying these things and they will shrug their shoulders and laugh and go, what a joke. You know, like, you guys have all this power and we don't feel sorry for you, blah, 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 right? But there's no real understanding. I love adventure. I can never do a desk job. As a kid, I was always, always did things on the edge. I always jumped, like on my bike, stuff. I always do very tricky, anything challenging. This was, for me, adventure. I wasn't becoming a pilot for the job. I was becoming a pilot because I wanted, that was what I wanted to do. <laughs> At the time, it was going to be fun. People would say it's risky. I mean, but I mean, I was anything that would you know run, bring the adrenaline up. I, I was into. Living with a little bit of a gel in a rush, it's the way to go. I grew up in Regent Park. I sort of was always this little person who defended the weaker people. So it just kind of was a natural inclination for me to pursue a police career. I would have to say that the fear of being killed is minimal. I don't have that fear. Probably because you couldn't really sustain a career with that in your head every day. People think 
of joining the military, it's a normal job. It's not a normal job. People say, well, I, I didn't know they were going to have to go to war. Well, geez, for like five, six hundred years, if you're in the military, you're probably going to go to war. If, the, if you don't live for it, if you don't make it part of your lifestyle, then you're going to be in trouble. So when you join, it affects the whole family. It's very challenging and potentially very dangerous depending on what you do. What happens is you first lose your, your night vision and the second stage is you begin to lose peripheral vision and a bit of a Swiss cheese effect in the, uh, kind of like the middle ring of a bullseye. Right now, I'm at about 1% of my vision left in my right eye. My left one doesn't really see anything. I stop people and I see the fear in their face. It's heartbreaking how frightened they are. It's like, relax, because of this mythology around us that we have engaged in perpetuating. My paramount interest is protecting you and defending you from the people who will take advantage of you. Blindness is actually, in very many ways, quite boring. I mean, the other senses aren't nearly as stimulating because their narratives aren't as complex as visual narratives. I'd like to think it's, it's as rich a world as being sighted, but I really don't think it is in the end. There's a lot of mythology around that, I think. There's all kinds of mythologies around police officers. There are still attitudes that females shouldn't be on the job. You can't protect yourself. You don't have my back, you're weaker. Can I drag them out of a room if they're 280 pounds and six foot seven? Can I carry them to safety if they're shot? And you know what? Those are legitimate concerns. Have right, so you got anything on you should not before surgery? Those are fears. There's female pilots, female loadmasters, you name it, they're all over. You don't see too many in like certain roles because they don't want to do those roles. Who would want to be a front line living in a tent? You know, it's not very appealing.
But there are still a lot of young guys who don't want to work with women. And then, of course, there is the very small percentage who are just straight up and up homophobic. I think that if you're a gay man in the service, you have a much harder go than you do if you're a gay woman. The hurdle for lesbians isn't so much the homophobia as it is the sexism. Usually they're very, very macho type guys. Yeah, just the way they're, they have to be. Very tight. One of my friends, he was like the biggest pig. You know, like his pig isn't like swearing and chasing, like looking at the dirtiest mag, the ugliest magazines. Well, he's now a woman, a real woman, the full, full operation. Changed his name, but didn't know back then. No one cares unless you're not doing your job. If some guy said to my sergeant, I don't want to work with that dyke. I would want the sergeant to go, you'll work with who I tell you to work with and you will be professional. But that rarely happens because it's kind of like this dysfunctional pockets of families where they're like, let's just keep everybody happy. Okay, Joe hates queers, so let's make him the traffic car tonight because I don't want to deal with Joe. Most people in the military don't broadcast they're gay. Now, if you're gay in the middle of a platoon that's all straight, where these guys are hardcore, it might not go over well. It might be discrimination, but if that person could potentially get the whole group killed, then you're gonna have to think about the bigger picture and maybe move them into some other job. You know, you just have to be able to do your job. There's sort of always this vein of uh, privilege floating through the service. Male, white, six foot, and all the studies show, you know, the Ivy League boy who, who gets the golden running shoes when he graduates from the police service and, and is shot through the promotional process. And there's always those stories. You're never sure why you didn't get that spot. Was it because of my gender or my sexuality? Was it because of the color of my skin? I'm kind of like a minor celebrity in the neighborhood. Everybody knows me. You're a fascinating image, and you have a peculiar life. You know, you're, you're visible, you're conspicuous, you're the blind guy. So at least three or four times a day, I have to tell somebody what I can see and what I can't. You know, imagine that over 15 years. You can become extremely bored with your own identity because it, it exists at a level of small talk all the time. The hardest thing to adjust to, I think, is uh, how you measure enacting that power.
you have this authority that you didn't abuse, but you took for granted and you just said, shut up. Like just something as simple as that, telling somebody to shut up and going, wow, that was really disrespectful. Sometimes you go home and you go, you know, I really didn't have to have done that to that girl. I should have done it this way. You can never make it right after you've done it. And sometimes you fall down. And I have fallen down. When I moved into the so-called blind community and, and kind of started rooting around in it, I felt very much like I was in a group of people who had been constructed by a, a committee. And I think a lot of it's very artificial. I really don't think the blind have a culture. I think they're a fake class. They're just kind of warehoused on the edge there. I think blindness primarily exists as a community because disability is mostly a labor identity. It's mostly a way of dealing with people who don't fit well in the workplace. It's this idea of performance, the, what you can do with your body. When you're flying, you want to be a conservative type. You don't want to be the guy that's looking for adventure, thinks he can do everything. All the people that do these special ops stuff, they do extra training. They pick because they get good judgment and usually they're very stable individuals. When you do this stuff, you take special survival courses, how to hide from the bad guys, and then until someone can get you. And then in your survival vest, you would have typical survival stuff, some food rationing, some extra bullets, some mirrors, maps of the area. You usually would carry some money, uh, American money for bribes, that type of thing. I would usually carry chocolate bars. I figured if I was going down, I'm gonna get killed somewhere. <laughs> Nazi <Nuzzly> chocolate. <laughs> Marshall McLuhan's definition of a technology was anything that extends your body. You know, your socks extend the skin. The internet is an extension of your nervous system. Your glasses extend your eyes. I mean, the eye is a complex thing. I mean, it's taken millions of years to evolve the complex eye. And yet, the best solution we came up with for its replacement is a stick. It gives you depth back. It gives you texture back. It gives you density back. And it's wonderful because if it breaks, you can fix it very easily. I was very much exposed to the lesbian feminist uh, rhetoric around deconstructing the own prejudices that have been embedded in you as a, or me as a white woman with white privilege. and worked really hard to, to kind of eliminate that from my consciousness, or at least control it.
you can become almost prejudiced in terms of how you deal with crackheads. You know, it's like crackheads, crackheads, dismissive. And if you're not vigilant about how your calluses start to form, then you can really not provide the services that they are owed. I'm a creature of habit, and you move through the world as you remember it. You know, if I'm on the bus and it leans and I know it's my stop, you would notice that lean if you had to pay attention to it for that purpose too. My senses haven't heightened, but to the sighted it looks like you're being extremely sensitive to the movements of the bus. You're not, you're just reading them, and nobody else is reading them. I think the star and the racial profiling thing really caused us a lot of damage. I don't know how many times they said humanizing the police. How insulted I keep feeling when they keep saying humanizing us. Like we are not human, like there is a lack of humanity. And I think we're our own worst enemies. I have never enjoyed arresting people, and I've taken that uh, authority very seriously. I always, in the back of my head, have a consciousness about what the repercussions of every arrest is I make. The conversation's over. You can complain to the chief of police. That's not a problem. You can go to court and complain to the judge. That is not a problem. You simply were driving too fast. Okay, conversation's over. I'd like you to close the door and go ahead and proceed on your way. That's the safest way to proceed, okay? Conversation's okay. over. Okay, okay. Okay, have a better day. Okay. Be careful pulling out, okay? If you treat that person with respect, they uh, will treat you with respect. It really is true. I have not very often had to use force to make an arrest. Very, very rarely. When I was told I was going blind, it's what actually got a fire under me, and I went to college, and 
I ended up being, you know, pretty good at English. And I began to realize as I was going blind that language was going to be my surrogate site. I, I took a real care w with words after that. The first thing I picked up was actually poetry. I still think it's probably one of the, the greatest human inventions. Poetry is closer to dream than it is to consciousness. Music I came to as something to learn which has nothing to do with language. It's about time, and it's about that elegiac quality of time passing. You're really playing time. It's fleeting, like you don't get to go back. I still, to this day, struggle with victims of brutal sexual assaults, victims of assaults. I can go home and cry about a brutal beating that a prostitute has suffered. I've struggled with what I swore to uphold. I struggle with my past and what, I, what I've done that I could have arrested myself for. I've struggled with friendships and struggled with uh, lovers. You live in a state of feeling sometimes like you're a bag that somebody carries because you're never the one who carries the other person in the same way. So you have this guilt because you, your blindness isn't your own. It, it belongs to anybody else around you. Just daily, daily small things of saying, I need help, I don't need help, I need help, I don't need help. You really fill up with a kind of debt because people are always helping you. And it's very hard to give back in kind to the same degree when you walk through the world constantly being helped. It affects my, my relationships intensely in terms of my last uh, girlfriend, for example. You know, my girlfriend would go to kiss me in, on the street and I go, honey, there's that guy I arrested. I don't want him to associate you to me in case he sees you by yourself.
I'm leery to say this word, but it's true. I would almost refuse to allow her to walk the dog at one in the morning, or that I would insist she not walk along Sherburne and Gerard after dark. It's very odd for my wife to live in a house where, you know, I haven't seen her in probably five or six years. So not only does she live with a blind man, but she lives with her own image of being, being robbed. Like she lives un, in a house unseen. And I would like to give her her image back, but I can't do it. I'm starting to forget a bit what she looks like. that's kind of troubling too because you know you don't see yourself growing old you don't see your partner growing old and I think the character on your face is, is, is are the stories of your regrets and the amount of smiling you did or frowning you did it's a way of keeping in touch with where you've been it's, it's kind of like going through your your diary I wish I could read it. You're kind of like, no, don't speak to him. Oh, I can have a feeling about him. No, this guy's not right. No, I'm telling you right now, I know these kinds of things that actually were controlling her life. And embedding in her a fear of the world that I shouldn't have embedded. The nice side of it, though, is that you do develop a kind of intimacy that I don't know if sighted couples have. Truly, my imagination is, is filled with the things Tracy chooses to tell me from the world around me. So there's that sense that she, she knows my own mind that well and keeps it you know, keeps the shelves full of stuff to play with. Uh, and again, you, you have that sense of you don't know what you're giving back in kind. You know, what, what does she get out of all this? My biggest fear for my nephews is that they get involved in violence from the pressures of, of how hip it is to be a part of a group. Because there's a group of kids who really strongly believe that that's, you get your creds from beating somebody up. You get respect from you know, being misogynist and sexist and sexually harassing girls in the hallways. That they know that it's not cool to get arrested. That they learn that that's fucked and that it gets them nowhere. I'm bothered by a culture that's afraid of the character of age. And that's like saying you want a landscape that is smooth, it has no rivers. 
It's got nothing etched into it. It's got no texture. It's like saying you don't want history. That's because it's a culture that is obsessed with the archetype of youth. There will always be Peter Pan as long as children are gay, innocent, and heartless. And the reason children are heartless is because they have no memories, they have no regrets. When you're younger, you, you always think you're never gonna die. It's kind of weird. It's not till you're, I think, 30, I think. Just say, okay, remember, this is a lifestyle and you could be killed. So as long as they realize that, I uh, had occasion to investigate uh, a particularly heinous child pornography case where the pictures were so disturbing that I couldn't have sex for a couple of months. I couldn't, without having that flash in my head in the middle of sex, that flash of that three-year-old being raped, I can't remember a full visual field, so I find that I, in my mind's eye, I'm scanning the image. I'm not looking at, say, the backyard from when I was a kid. I'm looking at pieces of it. Uh, the same way my eye now looks at little pieces, and, and it's like if you take a flashlight and you wave it around in the dark and you move it around quickly and you can kind of infer the, the full image. So I find my mind's eye is moving, moving that way more. I don't ever have wanted to see something like that in my lifetime. And those are the kinds of things you do, but you're in the middle, you've placed yourself in the middle of trauma because for some reason you're drawn to intervening, into making something better. And I think a lot of cops have that sort of struggle between, ah, I didn't really want to see that too, but I'm going to make it right. I'm going to intervene. I'm going to have some control over helping this person. It's a hard thing when you go blind to, to remember that your eyes are still there and they're still sending out messages and they, you know, they still have to go somewhere and there's no safe space, you know, you can't just stare at the wall or I might be staring them square in the earlobe. I spend a lot of time with my head down. It's just safer. Like, I still catch myself asking what people look like, and then I, I wonder, what the fuck do I care? What? Why am I even asking? So it could be uh, Afghanistan or Africa or Bosnia. Once you're in the zone, it can be boring or it can be very exciting. <laughs> it can go from one extreme to the other, but you're you're running on, you're basically running on edge the whole time you're you're in that area. Just just like at the peak of your whatever senses are all up. Syria would typically you would come in, enter the zone, and you'd drop the stuff off. Could be cargo, as in food, could be some weapons, could be people, which are doctors, nurses, could be soldiers. Threats are all around. 
course, they're not supposed to be shooting at you because you're a UN, but, you know, mistakes are made. You know, there are moments, and you're trained for these moments, when things can go terribly wrong. Anything you're doing is so sneaky. That's the whole goal of what when you fly the herd is you gotta be sneaky in, sneaky out. You'll be going in at night, low level, with night vision goggles, that type of thing. You wanna make sure that you, you're putting it on, right on the line or you could be the dead guy in the, uh, the dog fight. Every man around you is, is counting on you. If it happens, then you train for it, but you're, Chances of survival are very, well, no, slim, not great. <laughs> Everybody's afraid of their bodies betraying them, and everybody's body will betray them. It's just a question of when, it's not if. My uh, consciousness shifted about my own neighborhood when I started policing it. But boy, uh, a veil has lifted, and, and you see all this stuff that's going on. You know the guy you passed, you arrested last week. You know the other guy's a drug dealer. You know he beats his wife. You know this guy's a pedophile. the possibility of running into a gang member that you arrested and had a fist fight with to get him into handcuffs. But I've had moments, scary moments, of uh, guys that if they recognized me, it would not be pretty. There are moments where I go, I've got to get out of here. There's that old phrase that the map is not the territory. In my case, the map is the territory. Traveling is actually making the world feel smaller to me. In my own neighborhood, which is about five square blocks I don't leave, um, I have an extremely elaborate mental map that I live in. But if you travel out into the world, into the unknown, to cities you don't know, uh, they become small and terrifying because that you have no map of them. You have no picture in your mind of where it is you are. So it feels like a much richer world to, to live in my memory than it is to go out and experience new things. We were in Rwanda right from the beginning. When we used to go in there, we'd come in, we'd do fly total low level, go in and out. It was quite exciting. The war zone, or the, the slaughter, depending on the, they were fighting amongst each other, would go, sometimes it was right at the airport. There'll be guys there to protect us, and there'll be guys looking to kill us. Anyway, you land and then you would offload with your engines running and everything's done within five, six minutes because they don't want a plane on the ground there that could possibly be a target. As soon as we pulled up, <clears throat> a heat seeker was launched towards the aircraft. We have equipment that monitors like missiles being shot at us and we can disperse either flares or chaff to try to avoid being hit. 
In this way, we're hoping that the missile will go towards the flares and uh, not the airplane. Now we want to get back to the ground, low as possible. Then we shot some more flares out, and we proceeded to get down about, oh, 100, 200 feet off the ground and scurried our way out of there to avoid being shot at again. That was the closest call. I had to probably used about eight lives there. Just missed. You should always be vigilant. Always know where you are. Always watch the hands. Or we call them the delivery system. And never allow someone you're investigating to keep their hands in their pockets. I see everything. I see the drug deal out of the corner of my eye. I see the guy who looks like he could be violent with clenching his hands while he's coming towards me. I see all of that. I see lots of things. In Rwanda, I mean, that's a drastic case. That's where you get one tribe just slaughtering the other one. It's, of course, true, because I was there and saw it. So we'd fly over a scene where the people would be alive, and we'd fly over 10 minutes later, they'd be dead. And then we'd see them in the river. Much like a log jam in the river, you see in a very bendy river, the logs all jam up in the corners, and they'd be floating there, bloated. And they would change every day, and you know it changed because you could see the different outfits people were wearing. But yeah, of course you'd see slaughters. I can't even begin to understand a boy beaten and stabbed to death. And, you know, dozens of people walk by and not one police call. Most of them aren't afraid of the police, they're afraid of the retribution of their own community. So I think there's something kind of melancholy about sight. I think sight is very much uh, about loss. Seeing is actually, by its very nature, um, filled with, with holes and absences and things that have gone unwitnessed. And we've just convinced ourselves that, that consciousness is constant and uninterrupted. But our, our bodies don't work that way. There's still that quality that you're seeing the present, but it's already the past. It's a very mortal feeling that, that it's always telling you that time is going by and uh, you can't stop it. The hardest thing for like a, me would be handling the stress. I mean, emotionally, you'll see things that you're not, you're not used to but you can't let it control your life. I don't dwell on it. One of the hardest things that ever happened to me was that I was one of the first people on scene of the baby that was born in City Hall, under the steps, frozen to the cement from the afterbirth. Everything slows down. 
You're looking down at this newborn baby who isn't going to make it. You know, she's hypothermic. She's premature. Instantly thinking it was a joke, that it was not a real living baby, that it was some sort of special effects film freak who's playing a joke and filming the police from a distance going, ha, ha, ha. That was probably a moment that changed my life forever in terms of, uh, I think, in terms of trauma. The gravity of seeing this little tiny human being, the despair, I guess, is really what hits you. Seeing that child frozen to the cement newborn with the umbilical cord still hanging off of her, abandoned in like minus 15 degrees. Her heart stopped three times on the way to the hospital, but she, she survived. You never forget it. Those are the moments where you go. Man, this job fucking blows. Lots of people have trouble enduring some of that, and we would monitor that when we were flying. You know, you you might be able to see that when oh, all of a sudden the person is drinking all the time, you know, not just some of the time. Like you know, what normal is, or you could see them having quasi anxiety attacks, and you monitor that, and then you could well, you could pull them out of the situation. But of course, they monitor me still. They'll send me letters asking me if I'm having any post traumatic stress syndrome. All you see all day long are people at their worst. That's all you see. They've lost a loved one in a car accident and you have to tell them. Their father just died of a heart attack on the subway. Their mom has just been killed or we found their grandmother dead floating in Lake Ontario. All those are real events that I have had happen just to me. So you can multiply that by 5,500 officers. I heard a story about a guy once who put his left hand down on a hot element on his stove and burned his fingertips and lost the feeling in them, basically. He suddenly had to learn Braille all over again with his right hand. And he said, it's not like you can close one eye and then just open the other one and read. It was suddenly like everything was backwards. He couldn't feel the letters anymore. He had to learn it all over again. You have to rise to the occasion or you will not survive. Or you will survive, but you will not spiritually survive. You know, there's just a, a person who does what he does, but there's no, there's no light. You have to adjust to that. You mean there's lots of people that lose it. 
Yeah, I had a friend commit suicide. If you talk to almost every single copper, male and female, they would say, oh, it doesn't bother me. There is an opinion that if you just let the lid off of that, then you will not be a good police officer. Once you admit to an issue, there's concern that it's put in your file, there's concern that it'll affect your career. There's like, oh, Joe uh, was in rehab. No, we're not gonna take him on the squad. I'm not risking that. We've been shot at, we've taken bullets. I mean, I've been bombed, artillery in, in Rwanda. Well, when we go in there, we might be landing right in the, right in the hotbed. There might be bullets flying everywhere. That's just part of the job. <laughs> Sports and booze, that's kind of the mechanisms of counseling that coppers often access. I think cops walk around daily with untreated traumatic stress. I imagine it must be like being in a war, on the front lines every day of a war in their minds. Sometimes I, I worry for them. And especially for men, because they're so taught to suck it up. They're their own worst enemies in terms of really sharing with one another. How did you feel about finding that baby? What did that feel like for you? Well, there's nothing I could do bad, so the reality is I was doing my job, and you know, it might sound selfish, but if you don't be selfish there, you, you'd be a wacko in a insane asylum. That's what happens to cops. They just stop telling people. I can't do this. I can't tell her what happened to me today. Even though you really want to, just let it out. You can't share this with people because you traumatize them. You can't be a police officer if you can't handle trauma and stress and violence and adrenaline dumps, and negativity. The only thing that they are, are able to admit to is, is child pornography, any kind of abuse of a child. A man's allowed to cry if a child has been abused or murdered. Nothing goes terribly wrong if you know what you're doing. You also got to be lucky anytime you're at war. It's a lot to do with skill and luck. The lucky survive is what it's more like should be called. I don't like being around cops. I don't like discussing how fucked the job is. That's, you know, a mantra on the service. The job is fucked. The job is fucked. There's an attitude where you arrest a guy who murders, you know, somebody and he's out on bail the next day. And it's like, why are we bothering? You know, why are we risking our lives to put these people behind bars when the judges are letting them go in two years? Like, what? why? I almost lost my life. My family almost lost their father or their mother for this guy who gets two years less a day for killing his girlfriend, you know, or almost killing her. 
I gave up a long time ago on thinking that the justice system would give me any, any satisfaction because it's a joke. Now, if you don't want to do anything, you could stand back and, and watch what goes on in the world. But then you, you know, personally might be disappointed. I know what it feels like to just be ready to go home and you get that radio call. You're on your 77th hour in a seven day work week. And you get that radio call just as you're turning into the station that says, John Doe again on the corner of Gerard and Sherburn passed out face down. And you're like, yeah, he's always passed out and face down in dispatch. What do you want me to do about it? And you know that it's gonna be three hours over time where you go to the hospital, you sit there, you make sure he doesn't die, you da 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 you do the paperwork, blah, 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 and you hate that guy. You just want to pound him out because you actually had plans that night that got changed, that you really needed to go out and have a few beer, or you really needed to go out and hang out with your family or take your nephew to a movie. But you have to struggle against going, this man is personally responsible for ruining my night. I did 12 years in the military. If you're a hurt guy, you're gone basically 270 days a year. And if I was gonna do the family thing, I wanted to make sure I was gonna be the proper dad. In order to be the proper dad, I knew I had to be around. I wanted to be around. So I got out and joined the airlines. I could now stay at home, play with my kids, or go mountain biking, which I would prefer to do. And then I have days where I get one glance from one woman, one day in one month, and it's enough to, to drive me forward. For instance, recently just interviewing someone who suffered a heinous, brutal uh, attack, a prostitute. And she looked at me and started talking and I could see in her eyes that, uh, that she knew I believed her. And you could see her body just relax. It matters that she saw that she mattered and that it didn't matter that she was a crack addict, a prostitute, you know, a mother of three children she's abandoned for her habit, maybe an unkind woman. She's all those things, and I give a shit that she got beaten up. Those are the moments that I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And those moments are rare for me. Now it's a job, because you go A to B. I don't say, oh, geez, I haven't flown in two weeks. I really, really miss it. That's the decision you make in life, right? You, you got to sort of change your priorities as you move along. You, you know, life's not the same. You can't be 20 till you're 90. In terms of memory, I refer more and more frequently now to memories of photographs rather than memories of the images themselves. If somebody said something to me that really rang true, they said, sometimes you're the only Bible that someone picks up. I think that for all of them, police officers, there's something inside of them that they're healing, that they didn't get to do. And now they're just making things right.
I think that that's an incredible gift. My dreams are clearer than my waking sight. In my dreams, I don't use a cane. But I guess it's a, you know not unlike the way people in their dreams don't wear glasses. It's an incredible life experience, I have to say that. And then you watch the guys on TV and you know you're like, oh yeah, those guys are, they're living it. <laughs> living it large. I don't regret any of it, any part of it. I call some days my dying days, and those are days when I feel like I don't want to be a part of this despair anymore. I don't want to be weighed down by all these people who you can't really help. I struggle with that because I feel exhausted, you know, or I feel like I'm not living a more creative life. blind but I didn't know how to be a blind person yet and if somebody still asked me when did you go blind I don't know when I did I don't even know if I have yet I still refer to myself as a blinding man I mean I don't I can't read anymore is that enough maybe it's when there's no more light is that enough? Well, I don't know. I think that there's two, two paths I may take. One is that I finish this mystery book I'm writing and uh, somebody buys it and uh, become a, a flamboyant artistic individual. And on the other side, I uh, get promoted through the ranks of the service and I retire at the age of 60 collecting my pension and going, I really should have written that book. I should really stop and pursue my dreams. We're gonna have a kid in January. That could be the hardest thing. <laughs> 